this on you, actually. Oh. Go for that. It's important. I'm sorry, I thought, I thought you had done that. So in short order, I learned that you did, when you're around fighter pilots, you don't ever tell anybody that you've ever been inside anything other than a single engine fighter. Really? <laughs> no respect for the bomber guys. No, not at all. So I had to forget that I was ever in a bomber in order to become a fighter oh, pilot. So you made that conversion then? You I made the conversion, yeah. Wow. Flew, flew fighters for 10 years after that. Wow. We need to talk about that. <coughs> we definitely need to talk about that. Yeah, no, I, I, I started, let me just okay. grab it. Okay, so, um, if you could just start by saying um, your, on camera, just say your name and your, what squadron you were with, um, okay. as part of the 448, and what your role was, what, what assignment your job was there. Okay, all right. My name is, my, my middle name is King, I go by King Schultz, but my, the military, my first name is Edward, so I'm Edward King Schultz, Jr. I was in the 448th Bomb Group, 713th Squadron. I was an aircraft commander, and uh, I flew most of my tour in one airplane called Doe Bunny. And it was a beautiful silver B-24, and we had a crew chief who was a master sergeant. There weren't too many of those. And he was probably the best crew chief in the whole U.S. Air Force, as far as I'm concerned. So we did our whole, most, almost our whole combat tour in Doe Bunny. And uh, the same airplane, it ended up flying 120 missions, uh, which is, you know, some airplanes fly three missions and they're gone. And it got shot down on its 121st mission. And uh, the crew that was in it, they, they crash landed in Germany, the airplane's all torn up. Nobody was killed or seriously hurt. And uh, the fellow that was a co-pilot somehow or other got some pictures that the Germans took. And so I have pictures of the airplane that I flew crash landed in Germany, which was awesome. Uh, was that, and that was, was that 262s? Was it hit by 262? Yeah, yeah, jets, shot down by jets, yeah. But you might enjoy a, a little side issue on all this. I went through B-24 pilot school, <coughs> and then they gave me a crew. And uh, with a crew, we trained together in B-24s, because I was the only one that had flown a B-24 when the crew was put together. So when we got through our crew training, we went to Mitchell Field, New York. They gave us a brand new B-24 right out of the factory with 17 hours on it, and all brand new equipment, and our job was to fly it over to England. We didn't know where we were going. We took off under sealed orders and uh, so anyhow, the first night we flew from New York to New Hampshire, and uh, we decided we were going to name it, and we paid somebody 50 bucks to paint a name on the nose of this airplane. And the next day we took off. I had these sealed orders, and it said, open these an hour after he gets outside the U.S. And as soon as we got in the air, they all said, open them now. Uh, they said, who's going to know whether you're an hour or when you open up, because you got nobody here. So anyhow, I waited about a half an hour, and I opened it up. And all it said was we're going to the ETO. It didn't say what or anything. So anyhow, we flew from to Labrador to Reykjavik, Iceland. We get into Presswick, Scotland, and I parked this beautiful brand new B-24, and a guy comes out and hands me a single piece of paper, a receipt for one B-24, two, two pairs of binoculars, and a bomb site. One piece of paper. I thought, quarter of a million dollars <laughs> a receipt. And that was the last time we ever saw that airplane. Anyhow, the B-24 had a, on the steering wheel, it had a place where there was a little plastic piece that snapped in, and it had a logo of the Consolidated Aircraft Company that designed it. And so we got so upset with this, my co-pilot and I, we unsnapped these things from that B-24 and put them in our pocket. So after that, every time we flew a combat mission, we had these things in our flying suit, we'd snap them in and fly it, and that was our good luck charm. So when we finished our last mission, we left them in the airplane. <laughs> so that's, anyhow, that's kind of charm. How, do you, how did you feel about um, being assigned to ETO as opposed to the PTO or NTO? Uh, I guess I never really thought about that too much, uh, except that my mother had uh, been sent to England 
Uh, she was, came from a well-to-do family, and they figured that she was kind of a tomboy, and the only way they could calm her down was to send her over to England to go to a finishing school. So she went to a finishing school, and so in my, when I grew up, we didn't have tomatoes, we had tomatoes. So she, some of it rubbed off on her her whole life. And so I, I guess I enjoyed being back where she had been. So, but I enjoyed England very, very much. Uh, and I had, I can tell you a whole lot of things about my relationship in England and Europe after the war, but I, that's something else. Uh, how, did you, how did you find, how did you find it then? When you, when you first got there, I mean, what is you hadn't been there before though? You just had that connection with your mother? No, I'd never been outside of the U.S. before. Uh, when I first got there, well, it was very rural. I was, I was a city boy, and the uh, seating is in a rural area. And so we kind of had to kind of had to get used to that, particularly the girls. When the girls came around, I used to city girls, and these were country girls. And they were very nice, very nice young ladies, but they were just different from the kind of girls I'd been used to. But they were fun to be with. Uh, but I loved going to London. Oh, my goodness. Uh, and uh, you'll enjoy this. The first time we went to London, our crew, we'd flown a couple of missions, and we got a weekend to go to London. And so we get in the Strand Palace Hotel, and the clerk said, the only rooms we have are on the sixth floor. We said, fine. We didn't know what that meant. So we get up on the sixth floor, and about 2 o'clock in the morning, it was a warm, it was in the summer, the windows were open, you hear something go, bzz, 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 bzz. And then, how bloom you know, it was a buzz bomb. And the sixth floor was the top floor of the hotel, so nobody wanted to sleep on the sixth floor. <laughs> and we hadn't known that. So we got smart a little quicker after that. So then, uh, I guess it was on the same trip, uh, uh, my uh, co-pilot and I, or, or rather our, our navigator and I, we, we met two girls. and. Uh, we were in a taxi cab, and we were driving through London, and suddenly the cab driver pulls over the curb, and he stops, and he gets out, and he climbs underneath the cab. In those days, the cabs are kind of high off the ground, and the two girls got on the floor, and there was a big rug back there, and they pull it over themselves, and so we got out to see what was going on, and we saw this buzz bomb go by like this. You could see this little glow, and then it's a whip, and then ba-boom, and then everybody got back, and, and the cab took off, and it was business as usual. So. We kind of got educated that way, and that was kind of unique. But the, the people over there, they were, they were really nice, I have to say that. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard anybody, anything bad to say about any of the, the English people. It's, it's certainly, I didn't. Uh, did, you, um, did you have any experience of like children's parties on base, that sort of thing, parties? Or? Uh, that happened, but the, the, I think it was mostly our enlisted men that did that. If they had one involving officers, I was not aware of it. So, so I don't know. I know they, they did happen, and there were all kinds of special relations with some of the families that lived right close to seating and their, their kids. And, uh, and, and I, I guess you probably realize it, uh, that we're part of the 2nd Air Division. And I represent the 448, the Second Air Division, so I write the Second Air Division, the newsletter. And people send me things all the time, and some of the stories I get are, are really wonderful. So I've gotten stories about that, uh, uh, like one fellow was, wrote one recently, and I think maybe I put it in there, where uh, his mother did, uh, she did laundry. I think she did some tailoring for the, the base. And uh, there's a little girl, she was seven years old or something, and she got very close to some of the GIs in her 448. So there were a lot of, lot of these kind of relationships that were beautiful that I learned about after the war. And Pat, you know, uh, she was that way. Uh, she was only about 11 or 12, I think, during World War II. So. Well, the first time I flew, uh, what they, they normally did was they'd take the, 
the, the uh, first pilot and put him in the co-pilot seat of an experienced crew for his first mission, which was a very good idea because the problem is no, no matter how much you can train a crew, uh, you can train them all about the airplane, how everything works and all that sort of thing, see, but when something happens and you've got to make decisions, you don't have a background to make good decisions about all kinds of things that could happen. So that was one of the things they did that was wise. So my first mission was a, uh, what they call a no ball, where they had no balls in the airplane, no ball turrets. And we went over and bombed a, uh, a rocket site near the co uh, in France near the coast. It was a piece of cake. But my second combat mission is the one you want to hear about, and that was D-Day. Have you heard about that? Anybody talk about that in here? Um, not no, not, not, I could have mentioned it, but not. Well, this was something else. Uh, this is our first mission as a crew. And so we go down to the briefing room. We sit there, and there's all kinds of hush-hush, this, that, and the other. And the colonel comes walking in, and he strides up to the front, and he's got this thing in his hand. He says, you know what this is? He says, this is a shillelagh. And I'm going to beat you guys. It won't stay in, in a tight formation. But then he said, and, but today, he said, oh, and we got, we went earlier than usual. And he said, this is what you've all been dreaming of. The, this is the, the, uh, the day of the invasion. There's going to be an invasion. We're going to have a pre-dawn takeoff, which they'd never done before. Well, flying formation in the daytime is one thing, but flying it at night is something else. So typically when you took off, you take off and you go to what they call a puncher beacon and you make a turn to a heading and you fly out uh, to a certain altitude and you turn back to the puncher and you keep going like this, this racetrack till you got up on top of the overcast. So we were supposed to form up at something like 8,000 feet. And so because it was dark, they said that the lead airplane of each uh, group would be firing a particular kind of flares, like in our case it was something like green, green flares and at the, the, uh, in the uh, tail of the, the lead airplane, which was our formation ship, the tail gunner was back there with a biscuit gun, and he would be uh, blinking a particular letter. In our case, it was the letter I, which is dot, dot. So we're looking for green, green flares and a dot, dot flashing out of the rear of an airplane. <clears throat> so we get up there in the altitude where we're supposed to form the little thin layers of clouds. And so we're sort of either above or below these things, and here you see a couple of flares come up through a layer of clouds, but you can't see the airplanes because we're down here. <laughs> You're afraid to go down. You might run on top of somebody. And so we're chasing around all over the place trying to get into formation. Uh, so we chased around for half an hour and chasing flares and dots. That we never could connect with all this. So finally, we get uh, two-thirds of the way down there. We're out over the, the, uh, the channel, and I saw... I've never seen so many boats, and I didn't, in my whole life, I didn't think there were that many boats and ships. But we got way down there, I mean, we were afraid to, we didn't know enough to just, when you get a little smarter, see, what you do, you just climb onto whatever unit you see and go with them and drop your bombs and come back with them. We didn't know enough about that, so we, we got down close to the shore, and then we decided, well, we better go back, so we went back with our bombs. As we get halfway back, and I called our navigator, Dozier, and I said, where are we? He says, how do I know where we are? We've been going like this all over the place. And in those days, we had a G-box. And uh, the G-box was something that uh, navigators would kind of had to get used to, and he was sort of getting used to it. Anyhow, we found our way back, and that was our D-Day experience. But it was awesome, just awesome to see that many boats down there. Um, did you have to fly out any, did you go out any more times on D-Day? Was that the one? No, we only went that one time. 448th, I think, went out at least three times, three different groups, but they didn't use us anymore. I guess they figured they didn't need a green crew doing this, and we were as green as green could be. Uh, what else you want to know? Yeah. Um, uh, what about any, are there any other significant uh, missions in terms of maybe like difficult targets or like missions or like ones where you had a, um, uh, 
Q62s or a lot of a lot of enemy fighters? No, no, we were lucky. Uh, our uh, the 448s, our group commander and the executive officer were were both sticklers for a tight formation. Well, tight formation, when the enemy fighters are around, if you're flying real tight formation, they can't just come honking through like that. And, and the firepower against them is much greater. So they tended to go along and look for groups where they were flying further apart, looser formation. So we were pretty well blessed by having a lot of discipline to fly tight formation in the 448 bomb group. So I could see the, when you're flying along, you could see the, the, the Nazis up there. And you could always tell, even though they're just dots in the sky, you could tell which were them and which were ours because our fighters always flew in, in, in the, the U.S. and twos. You got a, a, a pilot and a wingman. And if you got a flight of four, you got... Uh, uh, the, they got the, the uh, deputy lead or the, the, the second in command, and he's got a wingman, and so the four of them are going like this, but they're always in twos. And you could see, even though maybe they weren't tight formation, you could see the way they were flying that they were ours. And the Nazis were just sort of there. And so we used to see them going by, and we knew they were going, they'd go flying down over our group and down to hit somebody else. So they were there, but we never got, never got attacked in any of the missions I was on. But I think probably the toughest mission that we had, for us at least, the most awesome was we went to Ludwigshaven. And this is one of those ones where they had, a, I don't know, a thousand bombers or something. It was a huge long string that was a hundred miles long of just bombers after bombers after bombers. And when the lead airplane dropped a, its bomb, the lead airplane always had a couple of bombs that had at least one had a smoke on it. So they'd drop this bomb and this trail of smoke would go down. And so by the time we were bombing, most of the time what we were doing is when you'd see his bombs go out, everybody else would drop on him rather than have the bombardier each with their individual sights. <coughs> and so when we're going to Ludwigshaven, way up ahead, you know, 100 miles ahead before we get there, all these lead aircraft had dropped their smoke bombs and made a trail of smoke like this, and then the winds changed direction at all different altitudes. There are these jagged smoke trails all over the place, and then all the flak that went off, and the flak made black balls of smoke. So here are these black puffs of smoke. So you're headed into this thing, we're up at 25,000 feet, and you're headed into this thing, oh my, oh, I can't believe we're gonna go into that, you know, and of course, once you get within range of their guns, then this stuff starts going off, and when a flak goes off, it, it just sounds like a bunch of peas on a tin roof. It's punching holes in your airplane, but uh, that's what it sounded like. So we, we go through this and clench our teeth, and there were, oh, and there were a couple of airplanes that had been shot down, and they had uh, caught on fire and left smoke on the way down. So the sky was unbelievably full of smoke from all these things that we had to fly through. And I think that was probably the most awesome one. <coughs> but one of the other ones that uh, you'll enjoy is uh, my last mission was the uh, low-level support mission for in Nijmegen, the Netherlands, uh, where we'd had a glider invasion. Our, our ground troops had gone in on gliders and para drum parachutes, and we went in a day or so after to support them. And so we trained for, I guess, four or five days flying on a deck to uh, go in and support them. So when we did, instead of having bombs, we were dropping out bundles with guns and ammunition and food and medical supplies and whatever else. So we flew on the deck, and uh, so I, we were deputy lead in our airplane. And so uh, we're down on the deck, and you, you're so low you could see people down there, and they're shooting at us with pistols and rifles and whatnot, and uh, the Germans were. And what they were doing is they were aiming at the lead aircraft, but because of the speed, they were hitting the people behind us. So unbeknownst to us, because there's radio silence, people behind us were getting shot up pretty much, and we didn't have any holes. <laughs> we, got back. we were probably the only ones that didn't have any holes in the, in the lead. So uh, 
we get back, and this is our last mission. And uh, typically, on, a, on your last mission, uh, you you make a if, if, if there's no problems with the airplane or the crew, you make a low pass and you shoot a couple of flares out just to say, hey, it's our last mission. So, uh, and and uh, our crew and I had gotten sick on one mission, so lost one with my crew. They flew without me, so we all had exactly the same number, all except the co-pilot, all had the same number of missions. So we come back and uh, we come in and hear airplanes going in there with shooting red flares because he had injured and shooting yellow flares because he had all kinds of mechanical problems and loads of them. So one by one they landed and we're the, when after everybody's landed, I called the tower and said, can I make a low pass? And they said, sure. So I come down and go up like this and unbeknownst to me, the two guys in the waist had gotten two extra very pistols and extra boxes of flares. So they're shooting flares out of both sides of the waist. And, the other flight engineer was shooting them out of the crown. And so we made two passes, and the tower says, get that airplane on the ground, you're setting the grass on fire. I said, okay. So we come back and land, I expected to get chewed out. And the colonel's in there, and we come for the debriefing, and he hands me two bottles of whiskey, and he says, congratulations to you and your crew for finishing your tour. So he said, oh, wow. So that night, what we thought, well, what we'll do is uh, we'll celebrate, and so we go down to the swing and tit. I guess you know what this. So we go down to swing and tit, and, and our crew chief, he had uh, two offsiders. So there were three of them, the ground crew, and nine of us. So there were 12 of us. So we all get on our bicycles, and we go down to the swing and tit. And we got in a, in a sort of a back room down there. And uh, we all sit around this big table. And the publican comes in and gives everybody a big mug of beer. So with great ceremony, I took a bottle of whiskey, and I went around, and I, spiked everybody's beer like this, you see. So that's one whole bottle of whiskey. And so we drink all that, and then they bring us another round and take a second bottle of whiskey and go like this. And, and one of the fellows had, we had our Class A uniforms on. So one of the fellows had a, one of these GI knives. So he decides he's going to cut everybody's necktie off just below the knot. So you had to knot nothing else and take all these tie bottoms and put them on top of the piano and hang it over the edge. So he did that. About this time, we're pretty well through with the, the second round, see, and everybody's feeling no pain. And somebody came in, and he says, hey, Lieutenant, he said, I just heard the publican call the MPs. So I said, hey, fellas, time to get out of here. So we get out of there, you know, well, the, the back road to the swing and tits kind of like this with a ditch on each side. And I see 12 guys on bicycles that are smoked up trying to ride these bikes. Was an awesome sight. So we wrecked at least three of them on the way back there. And everybody said, Who cares? We're going home tomorrow. <laughs> so that was the end of my crew. Most of them I never saw again. So about three or four of them I've seen since, but most of them I didn't. Uh, so, anyhow, that one of the real highlights of <laughs> my whole career. Was that strange? That, that was quite um, a lot of people. I mean, that was quite. Yeah, they got sent back and to do all kinds of different places. Uh, mm. But there's another experience I had that you you might enjoy, and that is uh, during this debriefing before that we did this party. The uh, group operations officer, Colonel Grable, he said, "How'd you like to stay here and and work for me in group ops as watch officer?" I said, "What's that?" And he said, "Well." He said, I said, I don't know whether I want to do that or not. He said, well, why don't you go to London for three days on a pass, and when you think about it, when you come back, come see me. So I said, okay. So I came back, and I thought, well, sure, why not? That sounds like it's something I'd enjoy doing. So a watch officer, basically, you, you were in group ops during the daytime, and all these secret messages would come in. And uh, are, have you been talked about, have you heard about scrambler phones and things like this? Well, the way it worked was that the, the planners at the wing and the group, uh, the, the, rather the group and the wing, they plan a mission and say, right, now tomorrow uh, what we're going to do, the primary mission will be maybe uh, Ludwig's Island and the secondary will be Hamburg or something like that. And uh, the, we want to hit a, a factory, so therefore we want to use 500 GP bombs, and then we want to have some incendiaries and everything. So they do all this planning. And then the the group uh, operations officer would get on the telephone, and he'd call up each group. So uh, this is the wing or the division. 
guy. It usually was a division guy that would call up. So each, I guess we're uh, 14 groups in a division. So you get on telephone, he'd say, 338, here, 448, and I said, I, I had the phone, see, so yeah, here. So when everybody had checked in, he said, all right, everybody scramble, scramble. And so you push a button on your phone, and after that, he continued the conversation, but the communication was scrambled. So if anybody tapped the line, they, all they hear was the garbage. So they'd give us the briefing, and he'd tell us that, uh, what the bomb loads would be and on each airplane, what the fuel loads would be, and what the targets would be. And, and what to, so on. And so then after I got through, I'd hang up and I'd get a hold of the group armament officer and the group navigator and the group engineering officer and so on. And they would do their appropriate things to, to, for all this, these missions. And the group navigator, and they'd have to start organizing maps, and the group bombardier would have to get charts of the, the, uh, the targets, all that sort of thing. So, you know, one day I'm sitting in there, and uh, the phone rings, and it's a division. And uh, we had a UC-64 Nordwin Norseman. And they, uh, they said, look, we want to bar your, no, we won't bar, we want to have you give us your, your C-64. The, the Air Force wants to take it over to the continent to, to uh, survey the continent for bomb damage, places that were, had been liberated. And so this is a little high-wing, single-engine monoplane. There were only about three people that ever flew the thing, one of whom was me. So I thought, well, I always need flying time. So I said, I'll I'll say, bring the airplane over to division and uh, with all, the, all of his paperwork. So my sergeant from group ops wanted to go. So the two of us got in this thing. We flew down there, had an airplane, the papers, and said, here it is. And got in a command car that picked us up and took us back to seating. Well, then the next day, somebody from division took the thing down to south of England, same way, and left it. And the next day, there was a pilot that came to fly it from there over to the continent, and Glenn Miller was hitching a ride, and so he got in that Air 448 airplane, and he never made it over there. It crashed out in the, in the channel. So I uh, flew the airplane. He died in a couple of days before he did, so it's kind of interesting. Uh, and downstairs I have a film about what happened to Glenn Miller. I was playing it down there earlier today. Did you ever... Um No, I've read uh, Jimmy Stewart's books. Uh, there's a couple of books about Jimmy Stewart, and they're fascinating reading. But I never met any of those fellows. No, not at all. Uh, um, did you, what about um, when you were sort of in an R&R, &R, when you were under downtime, did you, did you attend any, like, uh, dances on base? Like, as you're shooting dances, or maybe the uh, 200 mission <laughs> Oh, I was there for that. <laughs> You'll enjoy another one, though. After, uh, usually after you had about something like 18 missions, they'd give you what they call a combat leave. And that was a week off. And so my crew and I decided when we got our week off, we were going to go up to uh, Scotland. So, so we went up to, uh, it wasn't Presswick, it was uh, Edinburgh. So one of the wider guys in 448 said he flies up there in a B-24. So we all climb in this B-24. And we get there, and, and uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Edinburgh, but anyhow, there's the main street of Edinburgh. It's called Regent Street, and there's a, a park that goes down like this, and a stream at the bottom went up. The other side is the castle, the great big castle. So this guy flew us up there. He said, uh, look, he said, after you get into town, he says, I'm going to buzz Edinburgh. <laughs> So we go into town. We stayed in the Red Cross, had a place for guys like us. So we stayed in the Red Cross. Hey, we're all just standing on Regis. Here comes this B-24. You're looking down on him, flying down this, this valley around the castle. Like, oh, good grief. Uh, so that was a wild, one of the wild things I've seen people do. Uh, and uh, anyhow, he, uh, I understood that he went back and he flew down on the deck and he flew over a couple of people's haystacks and kind of knocked them askew and did some dumb stuff like this. But, uh, yeah, I was there for the 200 mission party, and that was a beautiful, beautiful affair. Uh, and uh, I had a, a girlfriend that I had met in London. When I go down to London, 
I was at seating for, I guess, about eight, eight months, nine months, something like that. I always run around with her. So she came down to, to Narch, and she stayed in the a hotel, I can't remember the name of it, that had the halls that were kind of a little bit not quite even. Maid's Head Hotel, was it? Yeah, the Maid's Head. So she stayed in the hotel, and she was out there for this party. So it was a lot of fun going to a party where you had a girl that you knew and you could enjoy being with. Uh, and she was a lovely young lady, and her, this is to me the tragedy of, of England, she lives somewhere in the London area, and when the Nazis bombed one day, they bombed her home, and her mother and her father and her brother were all killed, and she was seriously injured, and she had recovered. She was probably about 18 or 19 when, I, you know, when we were running around together, but what a tragedy uh, people like that went through. So, uh, the, the, I was there, for, I guess I was there for the two of those parties. That was, a, that was along about November, I think it was. But then there was another one earlier on that we went to. It was a big party where they stood us down for a day or two. But one of the things that happened was when they had these parties, you know, they, <laughs> I don't know whether they wanted to put this on film or not, but they'd, uh, they'd find out that uh, all the young ladies didn't necessarily leave when the party was over. <laughs> Some of these guys took cots and put them down in air raid shelters and did all kinds of stuff. You know, it took a couple of days to get all the girls off the base again. <laughs> but one night when I was there, uh, there was a huge kaboom. And everybody goes, what's that? You know? Well, what, what it was was a buzz bomb that hit right near our main gate. And so a uh, bunch of the fellows from the group went out there where this thing had hit and salvaged little bits and pieces of it. And so then a day or two later, they're trying, they wanted to get all the pieces and put it together somehow. And they couldn't get everybody to let go of all the pieces that they pocketed. <laughs> this buzz bomb had gone off. That's one thing I, I really remember. Did you guys have a lot of um, souvenirs? They collect a lot of souvenirs and things to take back home to the coast? Uh, yeah, I, I guess so. Uh, I remember one of the things I did. It was fascinating. You asked me about being in England. Uh, I found out that in London, you could go into some of the jewelry stop shops, and they had antique signets that were used in days when people would sign a letter with sealing wax and they put this signet on there. And so I went around, and I had a girlfriend back in the States, and so I went around to four or five or so jewelry shops and bought a signet here and there, the ones I could afford, and I got about half a dozen of these signets and had them put on a bracelet to bring back and give to this, this young lady. And I, to this day, I think, what a beautiful thing that was. I don't know what ever happened to her, because. She wasn't my lady of choice, ultimately. But anyhow, I got an enormous amount of pleasure out of doing that. But one of the things I did with this, this girl that I used to date in London all the time was, uh, I said, I want to go to the British Museum. And so the British Museum, it hadn't, uh, there were some things that they uh, had stored away so that they couldn't get ruined in a bomb raid. But there were some things that they either couldn't or didn't. But among the things I was able to see were things like the Rosetta Stone. And I'd grown up, and I'd gone to high school. Uh, yeah, you'll be interested in this. I went to high school, and in my senior year, I had a whole year of English history. We had an English history book that was about that thick. And so I got a great deal of English history, something our kids don't get anymore. And so I was very much in love with English history. And so to be able to go to the British Museum and see some of the things I'd studied about, some of the things that had come from Egypt and uh, mummies and things like this, was an awesome experience for me. And I, I dearly enjoyed that. So, uh, and my mother had a friend when she went to school. I'm trying to remember the name of the school where she went down in 
I'll think of it directly. Anyhow, I tried to find her old girlfriend from, from high school. And I found her name and address and everything. Went there one day and left my card, but I never did connect with her. That was, I was kind of disappointed in that. Um, the, the VE Day, were you there for the VE Day celebration this evening? No, no, I was gone. I got sent back to the States, and uh, in fact, you want to hear the rest of my World War II? Uh -huh. I finally f figured out that this job I had in group ops wasn't going to go anywhere, and so I said, well, I want to go back to the States. Well, they had to send me back because I was a happy warrior. So I got sent back, and I was born and raised in Maryland, in Baltimore. And uh, my family, my father had been ill, and so he had gone to the mountains of Southern California for his health, he and my mother. So I <coughs> have orders sending me to Southern California to spend my 30 days leave before I get reassigned. So I go up to Santa Ana, California to get reassigned, and they said, we need somebody like you with an engineering background and a combat pilot as a test pilot at Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. How'd you like to do that? Uh, oh, my. So, the th <laughs> theoretically, that's as far away from my theoretical home in California as I could take me. But it was on my own backyard where I was born and raised in Maryland. So, that, oh, man, it's like dying and going to heaven. So, I got sent to Aberdeen Proving Ground, Maryland. And uh, we were uh, testing airborne ordnance. So we did a lot of interesting uh, testing. Among the things that we tested was the fuse that we always figured was some other purpose, but actually was a fuse for the atomic bomb. So I had uh, a lot of experience on what set that bomb off. And that was an interesting thing to do. Uh, you might be interested in how that worked. We had a... <coughs> We'd, we'd, uh, they'd say, okay, you have six bombs. These are all practice bombs. It just had sand in them, but it had a little fuse in them that would let off a puff of smoke. And so we had a range where you'd start here and go down to the target, and the target was just some wood pilings in the water that were painted white. And we'd fly down this range, and it's at the release point, the bombardier had a regular bomb site, and at the release point, the bomb would come out. And, uh, at a particular altitude, it would go off and make a puff of smoke and then just fall, fall in the water. But down on the ground, they had a, a wooden building. It had no windows in it, uh, but it had a big lens in the ceiling. And one whole wall, like this, was painted white. And it had a grid, black vertical lines like this, and horizontal vertical lines. And horizontal vertical lines were altitudes, like, like three for 3,000, four for 4,000, five for 5,000, and so on. And the vertical lines were where you were in distance going down this range. And so one day I got to go down there when, when somebody else was doing this. And so you'd see the airplane would come along at, let's say, 5,000 feet. And so right at the five line, you see the shadow coming along. And at some point, the bomb would come out. And so he'd just take he'd trace this with a black marker pencil. And so when a bomb would come out, he'd trace the tra trajectory of the bomb, and then when it went off, he'd put a little mark there so they know exactly what altitude this fuse went on. It was a proximity fuse. And to me, that was fascinating to me to be part of stuff like that. Did a lot of that kind of stuff. So. so that must have been a lot of classified. Oh, it was highly classified for years. Years and years and years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And an uh, odd thing about it is that uh, one of my close friends that I was born, I'm not born with, but I ran around with a good bit, was the, uh, became the, he was from Baltimore, he became the electronics officer in the, uh, dropping the atomic bomb, and he's the only guy that went on both those missions, and his job was to, he had some exotic, one-of-its-kind radar, he was scanning all the radar range of beacon ranges, different ranges of, of uh, frequency to make sure that the Japanese didn't have anything, any radar, anywhere near the frequency of this fuse. And so he could scan the Japanese radar about 300 miles out and they couldn't uh, find an airplane until it was about 150 miles offshore with their own radar. And so he was a guy that would have to say it's okay to 
to arm the bomb before we drop it. So he was the only one that went on both of those missions. He was an interesting guy. <laughs> so he was on another guy, a yeah. boxcar. Yeah, he wasn't a bombardier. He was a guy that said it's okay to, to, to arm it because their radar won't interfere with... Because if their radar set that fuse off, yeah, goodbye. And he, so he was what, he was like a childhood friend? Yeah, he and I went to Johns Hopkins together pre-war. Uh, and I had an automobile, and he lived about a block and a half away, and he used to help pay for the gas to drive it across town to school, so he was a friend, yeah. And he was Jewish. And his mother was, oh, that's another whole story about their family. His mother was very much involved in bringing uh, Jewish people uh, out of Europe during the Nazi years. Well, what about your experience with um, jet fighters? I didn't have any jet, f oh, you mean after the war? Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, fighters after the war. Well, I was a first lieutenant, and I go down there, and I, here I've got a couple of years of engineering school, I'm back in my third year at Johns Hopkins, and, uh, and I had worked in an airplane factory a couple of times, and had a lot of experience doing that. So I go down there to join this fighter squad, and the colonel, fortunately, wasn't a fighter pilot, he was a bomber pilot, but everybody else were fighter people. And so he said, well, basically he'd like to have somebody with my background, but he said he couldn't let me in as a first lieutenant because he had first lieutenants that were coming in there were aces. So the only way he could let me in would be as a second lieutenant. So I said, fine, I just want to fly. So he let me and another of my buddies in, an old bomber pilot, as second lieutenant. We were the only two bomber pilots that ever got in that fighter squadron. And so then I flew fighters for years. I flew. P-51s for some years, uh, uh, P-47s for years, and the P-51s. And uh, we got the P-51H, which was a beautiful airplane. If you want to hear a story about the P-47s, you might be interested in that. Mm -hmm. We were flying these P-47s, and Maryland was the first state to get a fighter squadron after World War II. And, uh, because we were the first state to get a fighter squadron, and everything east of Mississippi was P-47s. West of Mississippi, they're all 51s. All those states had 51s. So because we were the first, we were the first ones to start wearing out engines. And so the Army Air Corps had a whole bunch of these R-2800 engines built and stored in boxes, pickled, outdoors, sitting in the boxes outdoors. So they just sent us a, an engine whenever we needed a new one. And our engineering officer said, look, you can't take a brand new engine like this and just flush it out with some kind of solvent because this pickling compound has gotten up inside all the little parts of the, the, the bearings and the wrist pins and connecting rods. You have to take the engine apart and clean it. And the Air Corps said, sorry, this post-war years, we're too poor to do that. You have to take them the way we say take them. So he put these engines in. I guess we'd been using, we'd had a couple of them around for uh, however long, I don't know, six or eight months or a year or something. One day a flight of four flying along and engine seized and the prompt just stopped. And so here's this poor guy, he bellies the thing in this flat area on the eastern shore of Maryland. And so that kind of shook the colonel up more than the rest of us. We thought, well, it's one of those things. You know. Then I guess about four or five months later, that second one happened engine seized, it, got, it went into a swamp. Nobody got hurt. So the colonel decided to ground our squadron. Well, we were part of the Baltimore, Washington defense complex. So that, that didn't go down well in the Pentagon. So, the, and, so he, anyhow, we were grounded. And so then, uh, so we're just flying T-6s and whatnot. And I guess we'd been grounded for about three weeks and one day I get an alert call to go down there. When you get an alert, you just go was on an early, early Sunday morning. So I go down there and people were running around with sidearms and putting ammunition in the airplanes and oh, what's going on? What maps do I need? Forget maps, just go get in your airplane. So I go get in my airplane. What's going on? Nobody would tell you anything. Just get in your airplane. So we all got in our airplanes and crank it up. And Colonel cranks his up and we all follow him out. 28 P-47s, we get out, taxi him all out on his unused runway, wingtip to wingtip. Okay, you shut him down. <laughs> Colonel's got his on a battery cart, and so he's sitting there on the radio, and finally they get, 
start them up. So we all start them up. And we taxi back in and park them. Well, what had happened was that the Russians had broken our defense network up in the Aleutians, and that had alerted the whole network, defense network, all the way across the continental United States. So everything got alerted. So then suddenly we're flying our P-47s again, but the Air Corps decided wisely, that it was actually the beginning of the Korean War. So they wisely decided, well, maybe these P-47s really weren't fit to take the combat with these engines that uh, were like that. So we got, talk about being blessed. The Air Force had built some, had built some P-51Hs now, they never got to combat. The ones that were in combat were D-models. Well, this H had everything you didn't like about the D was ironed out of it. It was a magnificent airplane. They built about 500 of them, and they were building them when the war ended. So they built them. They didn't need them, so they mothballed them. They didn't build any spare parts. So here are all these P50, brand new P-51s there. So they decided to give us these brand new P-51s. I got one with about 15 hours on it, something like that. Putting my name on the side, oh, it's like going to heaven. And uh, so uh, they took the P-47s and put them in the, in the boneyard. So that's so we didn't go. That's why I didn't get to Korea, because by the time we had trained up in these in these uh, P-51s, why they didn't need us over there. But this 51 was a was a magnificent airplane. It's a beautiful thing. I had the pleasure of one day of, uh, incidentally, oh, you'll enjoy this. We were having our annual inspection, and uh, so the Air Force sent an inspection team in there with a colonel and all these experts in engineering and operations and maintenance and so on, and uh, operations. And so part of this was to have a, a, an alert. We were interceptors, so I was a flight leader, and so. I was out there, so th the name of the game is when the, you get the alert, how fast can you get that airplane, get in, crank it up, and get it in the air. And you, you want to do it in less than five minutes. So I, I'm the interceptor, and they had a couple other 50 ones that were out there, and they were the bogeys. So I get intercepted with a wingman, and it was one of these days where there were shelves of clouds all over the place, and the, we're getting radar vectors this way, this way, this, I'm getting all these vectors. And we end up at 26,000 feet. And uh, suddenly, I see the bogeys. So I got, I got the bogeys. So I firewall this thing to catch the bogeys. And the uh, engine thing goes, boom! And a cockpit fills up with smoke, and oil goes all over the canopy. And I, I, without even thinking, I went, Ch -ch -ch and shut everything off. I'm sitting there, and the engine's still windmilling. And I thought, and, and the smoke began to clear, but since you're breathing oxygen, the smoke wasn't that big a deal, and, and it's saying oil all over it. And I thought, maybe I ought to turn the radios on and talk to somebody, and I thought, I'm afraid to turn anything electrical on. I could have fuel run around out there, because this engine's obviously come apart. So I'm afraid to turn on the radios or anything to navigate with, so I didn't know where I was. And the next thing, I'm into an overcast, but the thing is windmilling, and the, the uh, instruments, the gyro instruments work on a vacuum, so the vacuum pump's still working because it's windmilling. So I thought, well, what am I going to do now? I'll pick up a head, maybe head to where Andrews Air Force Base is, and the highest terrain there was about 3,000 feet, so I thought, well, I'll have a decision altitude of 6,000 feet, and if I'm not out of the overcast at 6,000 feet, I'm just going to roll over and jump out. So at 6,000 feet, I'm in a hole, and it's raining, but I can see the ground, so I thought, and, and it was in January, because I figured that if I had jumped out up there and I'd gone into Susquehanna River someplace, the water was so cold I'd probably never make it to shore. So anyhow, I could see I was over land, so I picked out a, a piece of lawn of, of, of real estate that looked like it was oriented in the right direction with the wind, the biggest piece I could find. There weren't very many, it was kind of small farming areas, I guess. And I made a, a Overhead approach, we always do, you come in, you rack it around like this, and it came down and uh, I landed on this grassy strip, wheels up, and uh, I thought, oh man, oh man, oh man, am I lucky to be alive after this. So anyhow, I got, and I made a phone call, and somebody out, came out and picked me up, and so later on, I got back, and 
uh, I got in the, the briefing room with the colonel and, the, and the, the inspection team and everything, and the colonel asked me what happened. I told all the guys what happened. And so the colonel said, how many of you would have done what King did? And half the guys go like this. He says, how many of you would have just jumped out and the other half go like this? <laughs> it was one of those things, you know, and you, it kind of boils down to uh, how much confidence you have in your own ability of what you're doing. So, anyhow, that's, I could go on and on about fighters. That's, we're way away from the 448 bomb group. It wasn't in a control tower, it was in group operations, which is a secure building, bomb-proof building with a guard at the front door, so nobody ever got in there. Air crewmen never even saw the inside of this building. So it was, in fact, one day I was in there and as watch officer, I got a call, the airplane just crashed, it's seething. So I thought, uh-oh. So I got on my bicycle and I went down to the flight line to see what happened, and there's some pictures around this. This airplane, you, you've heard the story, I'm sure, where these guys had crash landed on a taxiway and they slid sideways and they were headed for, they almost hit the tower. And I, I put an article about that thing in, in the, the uh, Second Air Division newsletter about this particular event, but I went down there to see it. And it was an awesome thing to see. Oh my goodness. Now, were you there when, um, when they had the intruders that, that night? When no, no, that happened before I got there. Uh, but I was there one time when an airplane burned up out in the middle of the field. Uh, B-24 caught on fire and they had crash landed and, or something. And uh, they just couldn't get the fire out and they were afraid to get too close because the bullets were popping off and going all over the place. So it burned. And so I got a picture of this thing. There's a picture of four lumps where the engines were and just ashes. The thing just completely completely burned up. But I was there at the time that they had the, uh, that a bomb dump blew up from one of the other bases. Have you gotten any of that? You haven't heard that story? Well, uh, they, each base had a bomb dump and trucks would come in with full of bombs and they would stack these bombs, different kind of bombs in each, each stack with different kind of bombs. And, uh, so one day a guy comes in, and, and the, most of the bombs are what they call GP bombs, general purpose, which means that they're full of something that you can't ignite it by hitting it, not like dynamite, it, it just won't go off. But then there were some bombs that weren't, uh, that, that were dangerous. So anyway, one day a truck driver comes into one of the other bases, Tibbenham or somewhere, and uh, he's lazy, and so sometimes this is what they do. They, Instead of unloading these bombs, which was a lot of work, they just open the tailgate and back up real fast, put their foot on the brake, and let the bombs slide out. And I guess this guy had been doing this for a long time, but he ha did this with the wrong kind of bombs, and he blew up the whole bomb dump and killed him and everybody else in the bomb dump and uh, destroyed a couple of B-24s that were close by and did all kinds of damage. And I remember when this happened, I remember hearing this humongous explosion. And off in the distance, you can see all the smoke going up from, from this event that happened. And so that was, that was kind of unique. Uh, and then uh, one of the other things, anybody ever talk to you about how we heated our barracks? Uh, one, who, one guy said that he had an uh, electrical specialist that made a, uh, made a heater and stole electricity. No, we had a... They didn't, we didn't have enough coal to, to heat anything, though. So some of the guys in our barracks, they, they went down and they got an old oxygen bottle out of a B-24, and they were a yellow thing about this big. And they brought it back to the barracks and cut the one end of it off, and they hung it off the, the, the rafters. And they had a little piece of aluminum tubing that came down, and we had these little coal stoves like this, you know, that had a, it was a steel outside, but then it had a ceramic lining inside and on the bottom. 
and they took a piece of tubing down, they put a little petcock on it, just put this little tubing down in it, and we, so we'd light a fire and we'd take paper and everything else and get the, the, the stones good and hot. And then you open this petcock a little bit and one drop of, and put oil in this thing, oil that they took out of the airplanes from the, the, the boneyard. And so one drop of oil would go down and go, and it would immediately burn. And, you're, choo, choo. and it was a great way to heat your barracks. You used up this used oil, and, uh, but it was dangerous, of course. So we had one of those, and once in a while, the MPs would come around with a, whoever, and they'd take all the stuff and take it out and throw it away someplace. And, and some of the entrepreneurial guys would go do it again <laughs> a week or two later. Uh, but some of the things that... I guess one of the things I remember is that uh, we didn't really have any any way to take a hot shower, and I could remember going in there to the to the Narch into the Maid's Head Hotel and renting a room so I could go in the bath. I get in this huge bathtub, bigger than one I ever had at home in, in the U.S. Light this big bathtub, hot water, and just soak in the hot water because I hadn't had a chance to do this. I thought, I was like dying and going to heaven just to have a bath like that in a beautiful, beautiful bathtub. So, do you remember anywhere else that you went to in Norwich? Did you, did you ever go to the Hippodrome? I probably did. And I remember going to, uh, in, I think it was in London, I used to go to the, the what they call the Burlesque Theater, I think. And those things were f really fun to go to. I used to go there with this girlfriend. Because uh, they, they it was a variety show, you know. And, uh, uh, did you see any like famous actors there? Or? No, never did. Never saw anybody famous. Uh, a lot of movies? Did you see a lot of movies? You know, the thing about it, I cannot, to this day, I can't remember where the theater was at the base at seating. I don't remember going to any movies at the base theater. I'm sure I did, but I have no memory of that whatsoever. I, I should, but I don't. Uh, but I had a bicycle, oh, <laughs> this is probably not good for your, <laughs> for your movie, but uh, we had a co-pilot, and he was a little short guy, and uh, he, he was kind of heavy set, a little bit heavy set, and his wife was that way. And uh, so one day, we were in London, and I wasn't with him when he did this, but he ripped off one of those horns from a cab that had a big rubber ball on the end, you'd squeeze it. So he takes it back and he puts it on his bicycle and he paints it flesh colored and he puts a little red thing on the, the, the middle of that thing. So I came out there and I see this thing I said, Cappy, what are you doing? He says, he has this big, big hefty wife. He says, it reminds me of home and you go, <laughs> squeeze that <this> thing. <laughs> oh my. That, Uh, I don't have any significant memories. I remember going into Norwich and walking around, uh, but it didn't, uh, I don't remember being particularly impressed, but I, when I went to London, especially that last time, I stayed in a Savoy Hotel, and I thought, la di da <laughs> I remember staying in the Savoy and getting all gussied up and going down there and sitting there and they didn't have a whole lot of food, but boy, they could really serve it. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience to go to the Savoy. And I've had opportunities since World War II to go to the Savoy Hotel. And, and that's a place I learned to enjoy. Uh, but I remember going to the, the Strand Palace. That was where all the action was. And some of the stuff at <laughs> King's Cross. <laughs> No, that's Australia. I guess that's Sydney, isn't it? King's Bloody Cross. Yeah. Oh, no, King, King's, Cross, um, King's Cross Station. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because you probably came in from Norwich, you probably went to Liverpool Street. 
Yes, yes. I mean, yeah, we did. Trucks would have been across town. Yeah. No, I'm thinking of Piccadilly Circus. It's where all the action was. Man, that was a busy place. It was, you name it, you could find it someplace in Piccadilly Circus. Uh, but I had a, uh, one of my buddies at the, at the 448 was a guy named Beans Baker. And his father was a very wealthy broker on Wall Street. So they had money they didn't know what to do with. And so things, the kind of things that happened at seating, I remember one time they had a, a bond rally. They wanted to see how many, talk, how many crewmen they could talk into buying war bonds. And so the, the winner for all this was, gonna, was a case of whiskey. And I don't know where the case of whiskey came from, but a lot, that was a lot of whiskey. So Beans decided that his crew was going to get that case of whiskey. So he just spent some thousands of dollars and just <laughs> bought enough bonds so that they got that case of whiskey. But one other thing I do remember that you'd enjoy is that uh, some of the fellas, uh, when, we, uh, when payday came, some of the fellas liked to play poker. And I'm not a gambler, and so that wasn't for me, but some of the guys in my barracks did. So right after payday, uh, others across the street from the officers' club, they'd go over there and they'd play poker. And this would go on and on, you know, until when they shut it down at 11 or 12 o'clock or something. This went on night after night, and then went right after payday, it'd be this many guys playing poker, and then each night there would be fewer and fewer and fewer. And the money would all, was all in the hands of the guys that were left until down after about two and a half weeks or about four guys that had all the money, you know. And there was one fellow in my barracks was, was one of them. And I can remember he had a hat full of money, it was just cash. And he'd send money home.